On today's show, we will discuss the most controversial subject in black communities, skin color. Why is it that 165 years after emancipation and 40 years after political independence, there is still a yearning among sections of black communities all over the world, and in particular the Caribbean, to be as fair-skinned as possible? How can this backward problem be eradicated? These questions form the basis of today's show, so don't go anywhere. Carib Nation is up next. Welcome to Carib Nation, I'm David Hines. When the Washington Post carried an article on skin bleaching in Jamaica, many Caribbean people were jolted to the realization that this age-old problem of skin color is alive and well in the region. According to the Post article, the use of illegal chemicals by young men and women to lighten their complexion is quite widespread. These young people cite social and economic mobility along with greater acceptability by the opposite sex as the major reasons for bleaching their skins. While this is not a new problem, nor is it confined to Jamaica, it is nevertheless a most urgent one. It is certainly part of our colonial legacy, where whiteness was the standard against which everything was measured. In this regard, it calls into question the whole issue of identity and cultural pride among black and brown peoples of the Caribbean. Today, we confront this issue head on. To help me with this task are Dr. Elliot Paris and Ms. Robin Fender. But before we get into that discussion, we join Dr. Golda Downer, Carib Nation's health correspondent, for an interview on the health concerns of this bleaching phenomenon with Dr. Eleanor Ford, a practicing dermatologist. Thanks, David. Dr. Ford, what exactly is skin bleaching? Skin bleaching can mean many things to different people. Uh, medically, we think of skin bleaching as removing of unwanted pigmentation. Usually this is the result of some sort of a medical condition which can range from acne to uh, some of the post-inflammatory changes that take place during pregnancy where the hormones interact with sunlight and cause what we call the mask of pregnancy or melasma, especially in women across the cheekbones and the bony promises of the face, like the forehead, sometimes even the upper lip area. Uh, it's good to see recently um, some um, attention being paid to in the literature and in the uh, medical and also in the layperson's press in terms of newspapers and magazine articles about this problem. For the layperson uh, walking around every day, to them skin bleaching means just lightening up the complexion, which is something that we don't really advocate in the medical profession. It can be very dangerous. Well, what are some of the health concerns resulting from skin bleaching? That's a very good question. Um, one thing that many people do without consulting the physician, especially a dermatologist, is they'll go to a, uh, an ethnic store, store sometimes um, uh, located in uh, inner city areas, where the proprietor of the store has been getting these medicines and these compounds and such from their ethnic or their, their country of origin. In this country, many of these compounds and prescription type items are available only by prescription. And so it becomes very, very dangerous when people use them without the advice of a physician who is trained in the use of these products. Most of the products that many people get tend to be very, very strong topical steroids. These are corticosteroid type creams, which we use in this country under controlled circumstances for rashes, usually very, very severe, mainly on the non-facial parts of the body. For example, a bad case of eczema or psoriasis in a tough skin area like the knee or the elbow, these creams are very, very safe for treating these types of skin problems. But when they're used on the face, which we don't advocate in this country ever on the face of an adult or child, they're much too strong. They can cause worsening of the acne. It could also cause stretch marks on the skin if used for too long of a period of time. Another type of uh, skin problem that looks like acne, but we call this a folliculitis, can be caused. And unfortunately, when patients continue to use these products, they get hooked on them. And when they try to stop it, the problem that they have created, for example, the acne or the folliculitis gets worse. So what do they do? They use it again, and it tends to control to some degree, but not 100%, and they just keep using it, and it becomes a vicious cycle that they can't break on their own. Now, for those of us living in the Caribbean, where we have the sunlight so very, very bright, and we don't usually use sunscreen, 
using, for example, the hydroquinone or a bleaching cream, does that exacerbate the whole thing? Are we more prone to cancer? I mean, can you imagine having uh, stretch marks on your face? Is that what you're actually saying? That's exactly what I'm saying. The use, the chronic use of these, these strong topical steroid creams, not the bleaching agents, we'll get to that in a few minutes if you don't mind, but the, the steroid creams are the most popular medication that patients will buy from just a corner store and so on without control in this country. And it would be nice if the FDA would sort of regulate this to some degree because these are dangerous prescription medicines available in this country by prescription only for the proper uh, medical indications. We do not advocate it to be used for the face and for any part of the body for bleaching of the skin. We have specific bleaching agents, mainly hydroquinone type compounds and, and, and things of that sort, which are much safer to use. Now in terms of skin cancer promotion and so on, the fairer the complexion of the person, the more likely the risk will be to increase their chances of getting skin cancers and so on. However, when you use topical steroid creams, and let's say you do get that side effect of bleaching the skin, and it is a side effect, it is not indicated to use these creams for lightening of the skin, but many people do. Um, it's really a temporary situation. Your natural genetic tendency of your natural skin color will tend to come back if you stop using those. So you the must use it forever. If you want to maintain that lightening, if you get that, not everybody will get that result. That's a complication that really is uncontrolled. Even the stretch marks, the steroid acne, the folliculitis, not everyone will get all of that. You may get one or more of them, but not, I could not guarantee, in fact, no one can guarantee that you'll get any of those things ever. You well, may get those, though, if you keep using these products. What is happening to the skin when it's being bleached? What exactly is happening? Well, on a uh, very simplified explanation, when we use agents like the topical steroids and even the hydroquinones, which are the more specific bleaching agents, it tends to interfere with the production of melanin. Melanin is the chemical that gives our skin its color. And um, this is a little bit of a, a little trivia type thing. We all have the same amount of melanin in our skin, whether you're black, white, brown skin, whatever. It's the dispersion of the melanin which gives us the different color. For example, in African American skin, our melanin tends to be dispersed always. In Caucasians, the melanin is in packets and so on. And when the skin is injured by ultraviolet radiation, which comes from the sun, it makes the cells called melanocytes make more melanin, and it also disperses the melanin. It's in packets so that they tan. And tan skin is damaged skin. My goodness. Is there any time that bleaching, over-the-counter bleaching, is indicated? And if so, when? For minor discolorations, for example, the blemishes that result from acne, um, sometimes certain rashes like eczema, certain burn injuries, for example, a woman who may be curling her hair with a curling iron, she's a little careless, and maybe it falls on the side of her face or on her neck. Very often, for African-American skin, it will leave a discoloration, a dark discoloration. The proper way to use these products, even the over-the-counter ones that are meant to be used for fading discolorations, um, they should be applied to the discolored area only and not the whole face. Because when you, when you apply them to the whole face, you're lightening up not only the unwanted skin, but also your natural complexion, and the contrast is still there. So it looks like they're not getting anywhere. I just had a young lady in my office today, in fact, who came in who had been using an over-the-counter preparation with hydroquinone, which is fine, but she used it improperly. When I showed her the directions on the label, it says to apply it to the affected area only, not the whole face. So for example, if uh, a person has, let's say, an injury to the skin uh, as a result of a cosmetic or even the curling iron scenario, which I mentioned a little while ago, they should apply just to that little discoloration only, keeping it within the confines of that dark area and not to the whole face. That can be dangerous. Is this some of what you're talking about in terms of skin bleaching? Yes. Uh, what are the, we looking at here? The young lady at the top photograph, uh, this is actually a patient of mine. She was instructed to apply the medicine to the discolorations, the little spots on her cheek only. What she did was to apply to the whole general area. And as you can see, she has a big discolored area. The spots are still there. And that's what I was saying before. When you apply to the whole area and not the spots, you're going to lighten up your normal skin a little bit faster than the discolorations. And it's going to actually look worse because now you have the discoloration on a background of even lighter skin and it looks much worse. Are you saying also then that if you bleach your skin, you can be damaging it? Is that the message you want to leave with our audience watching today? Yes. Even with the use of specific skin bleach, bleaching agents, which are meant to be used to lighten up discolorations, you must use them properly because you can also harm your skin. And when you lighten the skin too much, you are at more risk for skin cancer, aging, and things of that nature. What, what is the last message you'd like to give to the young people who are the person out there who may be deciding that I want to look lighter and I want to use a bleach? I would, really, I would strongly discourage it. Uh, many patients come into my office um, with that 
that mindset. And one of the things they'll say is they want their complexion to be brighter. And I understand what they mean, but I'll play devil's advocate to some degree with them and say, what do you mean? What are you, what are you talking about? I want to be lighter. And I said, well, where do you want to be lighter? And they'll tell me my face. I said, well, that can be done. We don't recommend it, but it can be done. But what about your ears? If your face is two shades lighter and your ears are your natural color, you'll look pretty funny. And then they'll say, well, I'll just bleach my ears out. And I said, well, okay, but what about your neck? Well, I'll put it on my neck. And I tell them, well, when will it end? Mm -hmm. Because you'll be all sorts of shades. Also, if you do not apply these products evenly, even on the affected area that you want to lighten up, it can be uneven and it look, looks much, much worse than you than what you started with. So your message is, if you plan to bleach your skin, get a physician, for example, a dermatologist's input, exactly. and definitely do not do this on your own. Exactly. Thank you, Dr. Ford. David, back to you. Thank you, Golda. And we'll be right back with that conversation with Robin Fender and Elliot Paris. So don't go anywhere. Carib Nation, we'll be right back. Them a bleach, they look like a brown in them a bleach. Them a bleach out them skin, them a bleach. They look like a brown in, y'all me honor you, and you no bleach out your skin. You no use no chemical, they look like no brown in, y'all me honor you. Save a place for me, save a space for me. Every year, the United Negro College Fund helps thousands of students Save go to college. But for everyone we help, there's one Save we can't. Please support the United Negro College Fund. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. Welcome back to Carib Nation. Welcome, Dr. Paris, Thank and you. welcome, Robin. Your first time here, and you sure would want to come back after we finish with you today. Um, Dr. <laughs> Paris, you're a veteran, so um, you'll take the new ball. Okay. Uh, <laughs> now, I was talking to a friend of mine about this whole question of skin bleaching. And I was positing the position that this thing, this thing has to do with a colonial legacy. And, and the friend, the man you're talking is chipping. It's you're always reducing everything to theory and politics. Is he right or am I right? No, I think you are right because I think we would agree that this is a legacy of European slavery in the Western Hemisphere, uh, you know, the modern period. Um, I think that earlier in the classical civilizations of Egypt and Greece and Rome, there was more respect for black beauty than you see in the 20th century. Um, and even at the beginning of the colonial period, Shakespeare was still writing about Othello as a very handsome Moor. Um, but with the onset of slavery and colonial domination, what Marcus Garvey understood so well that not only were those systems political and economic, they were also cultural. And therefore, everything European was made to be superior and everything African inferior. Um, one of our noted writers, George Lamming, um, has said that um, the worst thing to be in the Caribbean is to be poor, black, and female. Mm -hmm. Robin, I'm female. <laughs> Let me bring you in here. Um, do you share the sentiments that um, Dr. Paris expressed there? Yes, I'm going to touch on that. But first, I just want to, I feel I, I must dispel the notion that this, um, well, we're going to, I know you're going to be t touching on the bleaching that, and particularly the article in the Post, mm -hmm. where it is widespread in Jamaica. Um, that, is, that is erroneous. It, the article is misleading and um, it is inaccurate. It is not widespread. It unfortunately is happening, and it is happening in um, the inner city communities. It is an inner city phenomenon. And, and that is a, a very small you know, group of persons in the society. Uh, yes, I do agree with what Dr. Paris has said, where um, we, this is basically a legacy of slavery. And most post-colonial societies do have that problem. Mm -hmm. Um, Dr. Paris, let's, let's, let's put this thing in, in, in context. Uh, 165 years after emancipation, 40 years after political independence, why people are still into this thing? One would have thought that over that period, 
Um, th that was enough time for the people of the Caribbean and other parts of the world to really um, re re reassert and, and rediscover their the, the blackness. No, but you, you have a problem about the, the distribution of, of power in the world. Okay. And um, we are moving more and more towards globalization, right? And therefore, as we do so, the culture of the, of the country that is most dominant in the world becomes the most attractive culture. So we're talking about American culture. American culture. And the images that we see on the popular medium. Advertising, Madison Avenue. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's remarkable how we as human beings, we are driven by advertising. But we should understand that because a lot of what we do is culturally based. Um, now, Elsa Govaya, who was a, historian, a West Indian historian from Guyana, and a lecturer at the University of the West Indies at Mona. 30 years ago, she said that the Caribbean was facing a dilemma. And that, that dilemma was that in the political arena, uh, we had moved to a position of one man, one vote, giving power to the masses. And yet, at the same time, the old cultural legacy of the whiter you are, the more the superior you are, and the, the darker you are, the, you're more inferior in, in, in the eyes of the society. And that, that is a dilemma that has not yet been solved. Mm. Just as in the United States, um, W.E.B. Du Bois, at the beginning of the century, said the color line was going to be the question of the 20th century. And we are now approaching the 21st century and that color line problem has not yet been solved. So it will probably be the dominant um, factor in the 21st century. Robin, jump in here and um, talk a little bit about um, this phenomenon 40 years after political independence in the English-speaking Caribbean. Well, you see, we may have gotten political independence, but um, we're not exactly um, economically independent. And as Dr. Paris said, uh, the dominant the dominant culture will n always prevail, the one who has the, the wealth. We're still, we're still in a Eurocentric um, society, for, I mean, for the most part. Mm -hmm. The way we dress is still dictated by you know, the Western style. There, there are very few offices that you can wear your natural hair, and I'm talking about your locks if you have it, or your twist, or your bumps that is considered proper deportment, and we still have that problem. And as long as, as, as long as our sense of dress, style, what have you, is dictated by an outside force, if you wish, you know, this is always going to be a problem. The people who are doing this really do feel, and again, I'll say it's unfortunate, and it's usually done when there's a bit of despondency, like you feel in order to achieve, maybe if I'm a little lighter, I will get through because the, it is very much alive that the persons who tend to have a lighter you in, in our um, Caribbean setting, those tend to be the people with the capital. You mentioned the inner city in your opening remarks. Yes. And there is something about a relationship between the inner city and poverty. Is poverty one of the reasons, one of the causes, or one of the spin-offs, or whatever you want to say? Is there a relationship between poverty and the skin bleaching the thing? Uh, there, may, there may very well be, because um, there, in fact, a study was conducted here in the U.S. where um, they proved that women who had achieved financially, you know, and were advancing, they tended to be the ones who were, who were able to embrace you know, their, their ethnicity a lot more, what, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Dr. Paris, I know you spent some time in Bar your native Barbados um, dealing with culture there in, a, in an official capacity, but as a scholar, um, I'm sure you would have investigated this question. Is there a relationship between class and, 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 and this thing about skin color? Um, the relationship is that it is much more difficult for the person of lower class origin um, who is also of darker hue to overcome the obstacles than it would be of a person of middle class or upper class origin with the dark hue. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, it, the, there are gradations of, of um, respect and honor and admiration that are given in terms of both class and color. And when the two coalesce with the person who is dark and at the bottom, that is where the greatest problem is. So that you would see that in, more in, in, in the poorest of areas and in the inner city, uh, uh, as um, Robin has said. But it is important that we not discuss this only as a Jamaican problem. This is a problem that besets a lot of different countries of the world, um, the Caribbean and, 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 and America because of slavery. But you also see the problem in Asian countries of women trying to change the, um, the shape of their eyes because of the domination of the Western image of beauty. Um, so, but, but one good thing that we, we are noticing is that among Caucasians, um, there is a tendency in recent years for white women to inject collagen into their lips <laughs> in order to create <laughs> the fuller. We talk about reverse <laughs> racism, but there may be some kind of reverse <laughs> culturalization. <Right>. Um, <coughs> listen, you guys are not saying it, but I'm going to say it. There seems to be an indictment of our society since independence in terms of its inability to transform political independence into a sort a kind of cultural liberation. And so I want to talk about how we can deal with this whole problem of skin bleaching and negativity in terms of your, our identity. How can we in the Caribbean in particular go about is just stamping out this negative um, um, feeling that we have about color or skin color? Start with you, Elliot. Well, I would think that education ha is the key. But you need a very strong educational system and very strong cultural and educational leaders in order to overcome all of the inputs that come into the society from outside. It is not just an internal problem. It is a problem that has to do with the relationship of the area to the wider world. And the problem exists in the United States that dominates the area that although the United States is a, a country of diversity, yet there is a specific image of beauty that is still um, dominating the advertising industry. It is still affecting the celebrities. Um, you, you, you may notice that um, in the 90s, the, the album jackets of many popular singers seem to reflect uh, an image that is much whiter than the reality of the person if you see them in person. Culture and education, Robin, as a means of dealing with this problem. Definitely. I guess we'll just have to, and I should also add that despite all that is happening, there is still hope because there's still that countervailing subculture of black pride. It, it is there, but it's struggling alongside this very same problem that you have mentioned. Um, and we can only continue to promote the, the, the good side store culture, the fact that we have a very proud history, and um, to also to reach out to our, you know, our less fortunate, that sector of society that's always so easily forgotten. And if they can't get into the regular institutions where Dr. Paris is talking about education, you, you take it to them, public education. There is really no other way of, um, of getting that across. The issue of Promoting leadership that culture. Elliot Paris raised just now is an important issue. I'm putting it to you that leadership at the level of culture is important, not just about uh, um, appearing at a concert every now and again and no. so on, but really lifting culture and cultural education to the place that it's supposed to be. Definitely. Comment on that. Well, it, it is very necessary, and also we'd have to implore on our, for, for instance, in Jamaica, the, one of the problems we face is that our popular DJs in the past have not paid much attention to it, and they do have a very um, large impact on their audience, and when they put out the sort of lyrics that they do that do not uplift the culture or the black person, um, they, they they're not even able to realize the damage that they're doing. So they too have a role to play. Yes, the institutions, yes, the leaders, but the very communities, you know, they will have to get their act together 
and um, recognize that they have an input and um, they can, I mean, together we can all, I know it sounds like a cliche and we say it all the time, but sincerely, that is the only way that we're going to, to, to move in the direction that we so want to move The in. Washington Post article may be erroneous. They are prone to that um, over-exaggeration when it comes to the third world. Nevertheless, I think it must wake us up to the reality that we've got to do something about our culture. Elliot, um, she mentioned artists, the role of artists in this whole thing. Well, if you remember, in the 19, if you lived through the 1970s in this country, when the civil rights movement was at its height, you had reflections of beauty being celebrated by the leadership. And you would see it reflected in people like Nina Simone and her hairstyles and Cecily Tyson in braids. And um, th that kind of thing has gone from the 90s and, and, and needs to return. Where where black people have a positive image to look up to um, that they see in their leaders and celebrities. Um, and that there is not one general standard of beauty, that there's a diversity. In Jamaica, in the, in the 60s too, there used to be a, a, fashion, a, a beauty show that celebrated many different types, Miss Mahogany, Miss Cedar, Miss This right. and Miss That, so that you went from the, the lightest wood to the darkest wood. Each one was supposedly um, presented as a, a beauty. That, now that we're concentrating only on reaching the Miss Universe standards, maybe there is too much um, making everything the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that Ha, and that will affect the people who find them, themselves very different from the image that is being promoted. Robin, you have the last word. Well, I can only say that I hope that, you know, we will take, the article was a bit out of context, but we will take the good points out of it if we can, and we will really make an effort, leadership and all, and, um, you know, try to beat this. Yes, it's overbearing. Yes, we have had many years of, of Eurocentric dominance, but um, we must, uh, you know, be proud of what we really are and who we really are. And on that note, we'll have to bring it to an end. Thank you very much, Robin. Elliot, thank you very much. And thank you for tuning in to yet another edition of Carib Nation. See you next time. <laughs>